Welcome to Music Ed Tech Talk, a podcast exploring music, education, technology, and the intersections between them, with a special focus on the productive and creative process. I'm your host, Robbie Burns. With me today is Dr. David McDonald. How's it going? I am doing great. I've got my grades turned in. I am done until January. Such a different life. Such a different life. It's I do such a different life. <laughs> I have a, I do a break starting next Thursday, but the second quarter is it ends like towards the end of January. Yikes! Yeah, very very different timeline, and that is itself uh, its own hustle. But we are not here to talk about that today. <laughs> We're here to talk about craft, and. The many, many things it can do in and outside of a music teaching job. But I have some follow-up in news I thought we could cover. Craft, capital C, craft, not like the abstract notion of how well you craft something. Correct, yeah. In in the arts, we do do craft the things. Um, But no, this is, uh, yeah, capital C, craft. It is an application for iPad, iPhone, and Mac. This is a very useful and versatile app that uh, has really... I'll be honest. It's like th- this app has like changed the way that I do all of my productivity um, f- Same. since the start of the school year. And so I'm excited. That was a good tease, Robbie. That was a good tease. But yeah. I mean, there's like definitely a couple of like, I-, I would say like maybe two and a half things that have happened in music education technology over the past few months that have not been covered on this show. So I thought we would cover them. And you're actually, I think, more qualified than me to talk about all three of them. So I figured I would just ask you your take <laughs> on them all. And well, I've, I haven't really prepared anything, but uh, I, that's I fine. will. Let me let me at least get the version number on Twitter for uh, or for Audacity. So, yeah, I mean, I'll just say that Audacity has a, a brand new version. You know, uh, if those who don't know will or those who do uh, might or might not recall that Audacity was bought by Muse Group uh, within. Uh, was it over a year ago at this point? It was in 2020, right? Uh, I think I believe it was toward the end of 2020. The makers of Muse Score, and uh, the, you know, they have very publicly announced that they want to redesign a bunch of the app, make it friendlier to use, make it more powerful, um, improve a lot of the things that people find frustrating about it. Because Audacity is a very, very useful utility for doing like real minimal stuff with audio, uh, but it's it's also a pretty cumbersome tool. So uh, Audacity has a new version out, and I know that you have said. David, that like this really makes it something that you can see like fitting into your workflow. Yeah, and and I just checked. This is Audacity three point one. It came out in October of this year, at the end of October, um, and it takes Audacity to like it's it's a couple of very small changes, but um, they're very significant changes to the way Audacity works. I think it takes it from being an interesting curiosity for me to being an application that I can imagine myself using. Um, and the, the biggest thing is that it now treats audio clips um, as clips in the way that you would in the DAWs that you're more familiar with. Um, basically, it allows for non-destructive editing. So in the past, Audacity has been what is kind of technically known as a destructive editor. So when you, you when you you know shorten an audio clip and save the file, that audio is gone. So those those bits representing the notes that you or the the sound samples that you clipped out are no longer stored. But how modern non-destructive editing works is it saves the original audio file somewhere else and it just says we're going to use this portion of the original audio file. So if you want, you can go back and grab that data again later. Um, and then when you export it, obviously that stuff isn't doesn't come out. But that's what this change in Audacity does, is it takes it from being, and it already had some non-destructive features and kind of maybe behind the scenes acted more like a non-destructive editor before, but now it really truly is uh, something you can use as a non-destructive editor, which is super useful, especially if you're a beginner or you're working with beginners, it's a lot harder for them to lose data, which is like, you know, obviously really kind of, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Not disconcerting. Uh, 
I, I, disheartening, yeah. discouraging. I mean, like, it's, right, it's well, really discouraging to to a young student who like spend a bunch of time recording a thing and then it's gone because they you know hit the wrong keyboard shortcut and saved it, or you know just changed their mind later and can't get back to that state. Now it's a lot easier to do that that kind of thing. It has a, a reworked kind of cycling feature in it, which is really useful for music stuff as well. Um, it, I, I think this is a really important first step. I think it's the first major new feature release since the Muse Group acquisition. And to me, uh, it really bodes well for the future of Audacity. Audacity is is so uh, favored, you know. I guess because it's it is free, um, and it in terms of its features, however cumbersome it might be to use, like it's good enough for a lot of things. Like you're not gonna produce a song in it, but you know, there's just like a, a very very big need for that. Like I'll, I'll give an example. Like I use Fission, which is a Mac app by Rogue Amoeba, and I use it the way that I think a lot of people use Audacity, but it's just a nicer it's just nicer. It's less clicks and taps and it's easier to find what you want to do. And one thing that we do is we record on a little Q3 handheld recorder, our concerts. And then what I do is I go back and I cut out just the actual piece, you know, one by one, like each piece that's on the program. And I cut out the space in between. And then I add like a little fade in and a fade out at the end and I normalize it. And that's like two or three clicks in Fission. And then you can just take the selection and save it as a new file right from within, you know, those little tiny like things are, um, make up like 95% of what most musicians need to do with an audio editor, at least like those who are not producing heavily. Um, so I don't know. I, I just think as, as the free and, um, favorable choice and cross platform and cross platform like, mentioned yeah. Fission because you and I are Mac nerds, but you know, a lot of people are not on Macs and there are all sorts of reasons for that. And you know, more power to you. Audacity is now, I think, absolutely the thing that I would recommend to most people. And it wasn't before. Yeah, right on. Well, that's Audacity. I think with the non-destructive feature, they should have just called it a 4.0. But I realize that they have a lot more work to do before they want to really... I think they're going to save a major user interface overhaul for 4.0. Yeah, that would make sense Because to me. that's that's the, the biggest concern that I think I and a lot of other people have with Audacity is that it's just really ugly. Yep, yep. Well, uh... Personas has been purchased by Fender, and I have very little to say about this other than that. Um, you know, I've owned some Personas gear in my life uh, for a long time. Uh, Notion was the um, really like the only viable iPad notation editor. Uh, it, that you know, it's very popular. I know people who who use it as their you know across all their devices. Like they use it on Windows, they use it on Mac, they use it on iPad. Like it's definitely an important app that has favor amongst music teachers. Um, everything I have heard has been sort of, you know, from the inside of the industry has indicated that um, they're planning to operate business as usual, even though they're owned by Fender now. I don't know if you've heard anything different or have anything to add to that, but I would not currently, I would, I would be cautiously optimistic if I were someone who was using Notion and was worried about it. That's basically all I know, and and I would imagine the same thing is true for Presonus hardware, um, which is the the thing other than Notion that I think people uh, think of when they think of Presonus are things like audio interfaces. Um, I've used a, a Presonus audio box for for many years before, um, and you know I, I think that's also something that that we should not be worried about. And certainly, even if something does go south, you still have your PreSonus audio box and it's not going to stop working just because Fender bought PreSonus. Right. So the last little bit here, um, both Steinberg, uh, who makes Dorico, and Avid, who makes Sibelius, have both announced new licensing systems for their software that will, to be brief, uh, make it a lot less annoying to... <laughs> <laughs> authorize a copy of their software. It's way too annoying to authorize that software right now, and it will become way less annoying in the future. Yes, I think that's a that's a good summary. Um, if you're a current Sibelius user, you've probably had to fight with Avid Link at some point in in the last few years to to get software registered and activated on your computer. Um, they've seemed to have done a lot of work on the Avid Link infrastructure to make that 
run more smoothly on their end and um, to make activations uh, a little bit smoother, um, a little bit easier to work offline, they now actually have an option. You have to do this um, proactively. It doesn't happen automatically, but you will be able to tell them that you are installing Sibelius on a computer that will be offline um, and then it will not have to do the regular license check to the internet which currently will do weekly as of this change. Um, the other change it was to Steinberg's Dorico, and this is, so the, the Avid change is currently active. That was released this week as we're recording um, as part of Sibelius's 2021.12 uh, update. That's a, a, a year month naming system they use now. Um, the, the Dorico update will go live when Dorico 4 uh, releases, which should be very, very soon as we are recording this. Um, and uh, so that update will now, and I think this is incredibly generous of them and would never have guessed that this would happen, but um, they will now allow, starting with Dorico 4, you will no longer need the hardware key, the dongle, the, the e-licensor dongle, um, and you will be uh, able to move between now up to three computers and they will not require a license online check-in, which used to be the case. They used to, um, the, the, the way they had originally announced this change is that the Steinberg uh, activation manager would need to check in once every 30 days, and now they are removing that requirement, which is huge for a lot of people who are concerned about their connectivity, a lot of studios, and this is true of Sibelius as well, a lot of studios don't have their computers connected to the internet because they don't want something to automatically update while they're in that kind of high pressure situation um, where they've got a lot of hardware dependencies. Um, and so uh, that's gonna make a lot of people very happy. So now starting with Dorico 4, you will get to activate Dorico on up to three computers and there are no online license check-ins. Love it. Which is pretty great. Yeah, pretty great. Okay. Let's move to the main topic of the day. Hey, which is craft. I ha so okay. So this this is where I'll say the the little bit. So craft has been an app along with another one that is going to get mentioned later today, which is called Obsidian. Um, and and there's like that like others on the market as well. But there's, there's this category of software that I've been seeing lots of buzz about in the tech circles over the past year and over t the course of 2020, especially I really just started to see the buzz about this kind of stuff on the rise. And I guess that the technical term for this kind of software is called personal knowledge management, which sounds a little spooky if you're unfamiliar with it. So I want to just say that like the reason why this app hasn't gotten any traction so far is because I myself uh, was like personally spooked by it and didn't really understand what it was for and kind of like saw the buzz, but kind of also avoided it until it uh, just, I could not ignore it any longer. <laughs> Over the summer, I installed a couple of these different apps onto my Mac and really dug into Craft and Obsidian in particular. And uh, I have found a real place for Craft in my teaching workflow, especially because it is especially, I think one of its, its biggest strengths, other than being very, very easy to use, is that it is very, very easy to publish information that you create in it online for other people to look at without a lot of hassle. Um, so I kind of want to just real briefly address, like, what is the experience of using Craft? And then, like, generally, where does it fit into my workflow? And then I want to hit all the features and then talk to you about, like, more in-depth workflows like all the because for me it's not just one i'm not using it in only one way um it's able to take so much different information that i throw at it um and and like i'm able to interact with it but also others are able to interact with it in different ways so i have like it's just fitting into like more than one hole of my productivity workflow so to speak so and i think we should say that um at the outset i think robbie and i probably use craft somewhat similarly actually um but craft and other applications like this um i heard this comparison on uh, another podcast recently that that craft or, or obsidian these are our, our apps that are a little bit like email apps or um task managers that 
everybody has a really specific way of using them and everybody is using different parts of them. Everybody is, is, is doing things in a slightly different way and has very uh, uh, specific needs and they are in, in many cases needs. Um, and so th this is the kind of application that you can use in a lot of different ways. The ways that we're gonna talk about using them today may resonate with you or they may not, um, but there are a lot of different ways that you can use this stuff. Yeah, and I think what makes it challenging to talk about is is like everyone I know has an email app. Everyone I know, or at least most people I know, use some sort of application that has little checkable to-dos, whether that's as basic as remind me to call someone at 5 p.m. or like something more like OmniFocus, which is a full-on project management pro you know program. But what makes craft difficult is like, uh, it, while it's dominantly, I would say it's dominantly like a place where I write words, uh, it handles lots of mixed media in a really interesting way. You could call it a writing app. You could call it a note-taking app. You could call it so many different things. It It's almost like so versatile that it's unclear where it fits until you realize that the power of it is actually that you can make it replace a lot of different apps <laughs> that are in your productivity workflow, and then on the back end, easily share it. So here's here's just um, an example is like, um, I can make, like I can write a blog post in Craft and embed images, um, bullet point lists, like headings, all sorts of things, and I can really quickly grab a secret link to that document, which I could share with you, and then you could view it on the web which is something that most note and writing apps, while some of them do, not all of them do it quite as directly. And because Craft is so versatile, imagine having the power to construct almost anything that you can imagine and then being able to share it. Um, that's kind of the the way that I use it most because we'll get which we'll get to later with obsidian is I am actually using obsidian even though they have a lot of crossover um, but I'm using craft dominantly for things that look pretty and that I want other people to be able to see on the web yeah so I think you know the the, the this category personal knowledge management I think could also broadly be described as a note-taking app. And these are like personal notes, it's building your personal wiki, but one of the things that's different about something like this compared to something like the Notes app on your phone or whatever, is first of all, there are, are much richer sets of tools built into Craft for the sorts of content that your note can include and the ways that note can be structured, but also your notes can link to one another, um, which is very useful for building something that is like the um, like a like a personal wiki um, of everything that you need to do or that you need to take care of um, and. For many years, I have had things like this in Bear, and I'm still using Bear on uh, my devices, and I, I have considered moving all of my Bear stuff to Craft, which is possible and, and not too difficult to do. Um, but uh, I think the, the cool thing about using Craft is the way the notes link to one another and relate to one another and the structures that you can give your notes. Is that Would you agree with that? Yeah, totally. So, like, let's say, for example, that I am writing um, a, a note to... Uh, I'm taking uh, some meeting notes, and the title of the, the note in Craft is, like, you know, whatever, team meeting and then the date. And let's say that while I am taking notes, and I can take notes again, Craft does all kinds of rich media. So you can, like, scribble things with the Apple Pencil into it. You can type standard text. You can do headings, bullet point lists. You can do tables. Um you can do checkable tasks. So you, you know, I'm in the, in the meeting and I have, you know, I'm making maybe like a checkable task list of some things that I need to do when I'm out of the meeting. And let's say that actually one of those checkable to do's is I need to send an email to the rest of my music team to tell them some of the things that were mentioned in this team meeting. Well, I can write from within that task, type an at symbol, and then whatever text that follows that will become the basis of a new note or link to an existing note. So let's say that I'm gonna like uh, create a note where I'm gonna draft this email and it's gonna be called like draft to email uh, team, music team, and then the date. Well, I can just type an at symbol and then start typing that and then Craft will prompt me to either link to an existing note in its 
database or create a new note by that title. So I'll create a new note, new note by that title. And then those two different notes, that draft for that email, and then the meeting notes are like kind of like referenced by each other in the sidebar. So I can say, see things that are backlinked to the note or things that link in the other direction as well. So you're, it's like almost as if you're creating a web of information where you can easily trace uh, the breadcrumbs from one of your thoughts to another. That's, I think that's a great uh, uh, summary. I'll, I'll give you an example of a way that I am currently using Craft for something like this. Uh, I'm currently on a search committee uh, for a new faculty position in our department. And um, so we have regular meetings and I take meeting notes in Craft. I also have in Craft a list of the candidates that we have and a list of the people that we have identified as finalists. And in there I have also dragged in PDF files of those people's CVs and letters and all of their application materials. And those are all in a separate document. Those are in a list of candidates with all of the information that I have about them. And so from within the uh, the search meeting notes, from the committee meeting notes, I can, anytime I want to make a note about a person that came up in our meeting, I can at that note in um, in, in elsewhere in craft so that I can find them and get access to their materials and find any notes that I've taken about, uh, about their, uh, their materials. So, um, it's a, a really useful way to, to kind of connect different pieces of knowledge that are related and it prevents you from having to type the same things over and over again and update things in one place. Um, so if you have, you know, if you have a boilerplate set of text in your syllabus, you can link to that. Um, if you're writing your syllabus in craft or something like that, there's a lot of really, really cool things that you can do there. And of course you can link to regular web pages and things like that as well. So a, a related kind of note structuring thing, knowledge structuring thing. And really, I think when we talk about personal knowledge management, we're talking about structured knowledge and the relationships between different bits of knowledge um, is this this thing, and I don't know exactly what to call these, but um, they're, they're like sub pages that you can create within a page in Craft. So you can type a bit of text and click a, a button um, to turn it into a card within a page. And that makes this nice little visual element on the page that you're in, but then clicking that thing brings you to a little sub page, which is super useful. So I, a moment ago, I was talking about the um, search committee that I'm on and we have weekly meetings and I take notes in those meetings. I have each of those meeting note blocks as a card in one kind of big note that includes just our search committee notes. So the meeting notes I have in one place and then for each weekly meeting I have a thing that says, you know, meeting 29 September notes, meeting 13 October notes, meeting 20 October notes and and they go through and I have, you know, the same way that you would take notes in any typing app. Um and I have them all there, and they're all connected to one another. I can always look back very quickly at what the last week's notes said, um, and and that's a really useful thing as well. Um, when we're coming up with interview questions, for example, we like there's a, a you have to be pretty particular. Um, to ask roughly the same questions of every candidate in the interviews. And so I would have a, a note where I was writing out the interview questions that we were talking about. And that would be linked to from the meeting where we were talking about interview questions. Um, and then at the end of that, I could share that page just of the interview questions with the rest of the committee to make sure that we were all on the same page there. Um, and so that, that being able to share things on the web that you mentioned earlier has has been really useful to me in this and many other contexts. Yeah, I think it's really interesting that in craft, because as with other competing programs, what's at least unique in my experience using craft is that you can't, it's not only that you can like link from one note to another, but you can link from one line of a note to another. So like when you're saying that you're taking a line of text and then turning that sort of into like a sub document or sub note within a bigger note, well, that sub note itself you can link into a totally different or unrelated note. And this is the thing is like, um, you know, people are multifaceted, you know, are, you know, no, no person is just one person. Like I might be um, taking a note of like things I want to do in a given day. And like in a given day, I might need to take care of some house tasks, but also draft a blog post, but also deal with a handful of tasks related to my middle school teaching job. And to be able to take individual 
lines of one note and then c- create connections from them to other entire documents, I think is a real powerful thing. And then to be able to share them <laughs> or just components of an idea with someone else with a secret link. Yeah, it's just, it's crazy powerful to think about. And, you know, you mentioned that all of these notes can be kind of like little bits of personal knowledge, but what makes Craft stand out amongst its competitors is that it's got a really, really nice typography and um, the way that media looks when you drag in like a file or a PDF or an audio file or like a link to a YouTube video, like it looks really, really presentable in a way where a lot of stuff that would normally just be personal emphasis on personal knowledge management can now become something that I'm much more comfortable sharing. So things that um, that I might traditionally use a word processor for, uh, like let me give you an example. I'm actually thinking about turning my roster document that is currently made in pages into something in craft because I very, very often need to think about like my kids as also like pieces of data so to speak so like right now i have a craft document that's named after every single student in my music program and i can have a roster of all the students in my band but every single one of those student names can be a clickable link to their own document where i can like either um take personal notes like um you know note that i had to like call a parent about a particular behavioral incident in a class or i can even actually uh what one of my colleagues does is actually makes all of his student notes or at least with the secret link so that each student has a link to their own file and then he puts like the current assignment that they're working on so that they always have one url where they can see the most recent thing they're supposed to be working on and uh that kind of network of stuff will also like kind of, you know, making documents that can be like printed and shared. I mean, I don't know. I just It's just kind of a powerful thing because Craft Now is not just replacing notes, but it's replacing stuff that we would put on our website. It's replacing things that we would make in a word processor and print and hang on the wall. Like it's just, but it's all sort of existing yeah. in this network of knowledge. And you can put files inside of the note as well. So another thing that I did this past semester is I, I have two different sections of theory one and theory two in the spring. And the the process of adding a file to the learning management system is super tedious and annoying. Um, and so what I want to do is when I give a handout in class, I also want to post a PDF both for students who can't be there and also for students who prefer a digital version to a paper version. Um, and so every time I do that, instead of uploading the file to each of these two different sections, which I would have to do all over again twice every single time, I have a link in each of those LMS pages to a craft doc that has each of the PDF files embedded within it or a MuseScore file. We've used some, some MuseScore files recently for interactive um, uh, things in class. And I put those there and it's way easier for them to go to a craft doc and download it than for them to, and they can also then bookmark that, that, page instead of having to go through blackboard each time um, to get to the handouts they can bookmark that page and then just come back to it each time um, and so uh, that was a really a much much easier way for me to share pdf files and audio files and musical files with my students in this past fall semester i intend to continue doing it in the spring i will warn you if you're going to do something like that um, I, if I'm being perfectly honest with myself, I probably shouldn't be doing that or relying on it too much because the public web pages that Craft creates are not super uh, screen reader friendly. So if you do have any students who are uh, blind or have low vision um, and use a screen reader or any kind of assistive technology like that, it's not going to work great with the the web pages that Craft generates. Um, so just be aware of that um, and have a fallback or, or, or plan B or something if, if, if you know that that is going to be an issue for you. Yeah, that's a really important point to bring up. Um, well, we've talked about a lot of the different kinds of things you can throw into a Craft document. Um, we've covered some some basics. We've talked about how you can sort of create pieces of data within larger pieces of data and even create local links into them for your own personal use um, or even links so that someone else can view them on the web. Uh, we've even talked about backlinking, 
secret linking, lots of linking, lots of linking happening. Um, I guess if if we can, um, we could talk about a couple problems it solves, and then some of the competition, and then even our own workflows. You've you've just mentioned one of yours, but I have a handful of. Uh, workflows I'd like to cover. All right, well, maybe should we cover some workflows now? Would that give people a clear idea? I think there's one important feature that we have skimmed over um, at, from Craft before we get into the, the workflows, and that is collaboration. Uh, so yes, of course. anybody who has worked on a project with somebody else in the last 10 years on a computer has probably spent a lot of time in Google Docs, Google, either the, the, the Google Docs editor that is like the, the document editor or Google Sheets or Google Slides. Um, and this is like a... Uh, like like a notes version of Google Docs. It, it is real time collaboration. It is uh, probably the closest to Google Docs level of real time collaboration. You can watch someone else typing and editing and moving things around, um, and it shows you where the the other person is currently you know highlighting where their cursor is, um, and it, it works very very similarly to Google Docs in that regard. Um, one of the things that I think is a, a little bit nicer about it is that it is a digital first thing. So Google Docs is kind of built to model paper still, still built on the kind of Microsoft Word model of how documents work. And the the I think one of the cool things about Craft is that it... Um, uh, it, it doesn't have that assumption. It is thinking in terms of a network of notes in the way that we were talking about before. And it still is thinking about linking between notes. It's still thinking about having these sub notes. It's still thinking about embedded media um, and embedded files and things like that in a way that I think Google Docs is not thinking in those terms. Um, the, the downside is the other people that you're collaborating with have to use craft um, and the current way that we collaborate with craft documents is to create a whole craft workspace, which is, is like a whole craft instance and share everything inside that with everybody else that's collaborating. Unlike Google Docs, you cannot at present, and, and I think we're expecting this to change in the not too distant future, um, you cannot currently collaborate on an individual note. So Robbie and I have our outline for the show today in a craft document, but it's in a workspace that Robbie and I share. Um, so it's, it's not a thing that we can do on a one-off basis. Yeah. And, and the thing that makes Google drive appealing is, is largely its popularity and its reliability right. for that, that feature set of sort of having multiple people typing in the same document. And there's definitely times where presenting public information or even just information within a small network of people makes a lot of sense in a Google doc. Um, but I, I definitely still feel like the the whole interface of it, how it sort of like has pages and all of these kinds of old metaphors um, for like, you know, uh, publishing. Um, yet at the same time, how w apps that run on the web don't actually really feel super great for me to do the kinds of things I want to do with publishing software. For example, like drag images around to really precise locations on the page or um, work with, with borders or even in some, you know, some... Word processors will let you work with like layers and um, uh, you know kind of do do quite a bit more to make it look pretty. And I've just never felt like Google Docs are great at that. But it's equally frustrating when someone shares me a Google Doc and all it is is just like unformatted text, like just a dumping ground of shared ideas. And I'm like, well, this is not the right tool for that. <laughs> you know, something like uh, even just a shared note in Apple Notes would be a more simplistic way to deal with that kind of data. So I don't know, Google Google Docs, I'm just sort of highlighting why it's never really worked for me. Um, Craft can, amongst collaborators who are using it, can replace a lot of those features, and it definitely has the reliability to back it up. You can actually uh, work on it from the web, too. So you don't have to be an Apple user. You can uh, log, you know, create a login and um, Craft will allow you to operate. I, I think actually is the full web version launched at this point? I'm pretty sure you can just use it entirely on the web. I, I believe it is still in, in beta technically, um, but it is a very open beta. You just request access and you basically get it almost instantly. Um, and it is still lacking a few features that are in the desktop app, but I think if, especially if you're just getting started or if you just want to collaborate on some, some meeting notes with, with people, um, you're not going to be missing anything. And I, I believe, 
um, that the, the, the craft development team, which is a very small independent team, and I love supporting small independent developers, um, has, has said that we should expect that uh, the, the web app will be basically at feature parity with the native app in the, in the very near future. So yeah, in the same way that two people might want to collaborate on a Google Doc by sort of sharing some, ha having some meta discussion about it, I think it's worth mentioning that you can comment on craft documents. Even if I share something that I created as a web link with you, you can even add comments on the thing. In fact, I've, I've drafted blog posts before where I created a craft document that looked like the blog post was going to look with the images and the captions in the right spots, the headings in the right spots. And you've been able to sort of like type me some comments like, hey, you like missed a word here or something. And that's a pretty useful tool because no other writing tool for my blog that I've ever been able to use has allowed me to get that kind of feedback from it and also to sort of, um, you know, hold itself together in like, obviously, like my website has different styling than what a craft document looks like. But to be able to put the images and the headings in the right spot makes what I present out into the world, uh, quite a bit more like what the finished product will be. And you know, for me, I've done quite a few guest posts for other websites recently. And this has been a super useful way for me to say, here's the idea. What do you think? And just to get some feedback on the closest representation I can offer at that time without actually that person seeing what it would look like on their website. So it's been pretty useful. Um, something I use really often and is actually one of the most appealing features of the app to me is called the today note. And it's a, in the left sidebar, you can go to a calendar view and you can actually create a note that's associated with each day of the week. And what I kind of like to do every day is create a today note and then I sort of like to outline the different parts of my day. Uh, you might you might think that this, a calendar is better suited for this, but the free form flow of text and uh, media actually makes this a much friendlier experience just to kind of type in like, like what I'll typically do is create a note. Let's say that it's uh, December 14th. I'll create a note called December 14th. And then what I'll do is I'll type an at symbol and I'll type general music two, which is my first class of the day. And then it's backlinked because I have a note in craft for that class, which is just some general uh, goals for the near future. Some things, you know, maybe just some notes about like what the agenda is for the given day and like where we are in a certain project. Um, and then what I'll do is maybe I'll just take some bullet point notes after that, you know, that block of text, which represents the, the backlink. Uh, and then that text is associated with the day. So if I want to ask myself, like, what did I do in general music on last Monday? I can go into the today calendar view. I can click on last Monday in the calendar, and then I can see a whole day of, like, what notes I took on every single subject that I taught in that day, which is kind of cool. And I can use class headings for each class, kind of take some reflective notes on each um, and of course, all of the headings are like themselves notes that will take me into the note for that class. I can reference students. I can reference sectional groups because all of these are other just like pre-existing little bits of data that are in craft. And what's nice is that you can create checkable to-dos. Uh, sometimes things come up in the day that need to be addressed immediately or imminently. And, you know, sometimes I'll do some of my task management right from within the today note and it won't even make its way into OmniFocus, which is my to-do app of choice. I'll just check them off right there in the today note. But <laughs> what's really cool is that Craft has a whole system. They call it, I believe, Craft Connect. And it's a great way to get your data out. And you can get it out through as a PDF, an image, um, a markdown file, which is just all text. Uh, you can save it as a Microsoft Word document. You can even export an entire Craft document or a single lines of text two popular Mac and iOS apps, uh, writing apps like Ulysses and AI, or IA Writer. You can even check or select, I should say, individual lines of text from a Today Note, click a single button that has a cute little OmniFocus icon on it, and then all of the selected lines of text in your note in Craft will appear as individual tasks in the inbox of OmniFocus. So it's so easy to say, hey, you know what? I was working on my day, checking off my tasks of the day, but I didn't quite get through everything. Let me send this to a place where I can sort of like manage it more long term. Mm -hmm. 
And the the places that you can send things are getting more and more sophisticated and more and more powerful with the new Craft X, which we'll we'll talk about in a little bit. Oh, I like your drawing your drawing stuff in this note with the Apple Pencil as so, we are discussing. Yeah, so that's actually something that I have not done much of, but I intend to do more of. Um, and, and it's something that I think distinguishes this from a lot of Notes apps. This is something that's part of Apple Notes, but not a part of a lot of other Notes applications, is, is that on an iPad, um, it's very easy to insert a drawing. Um, so I just, with a, a, my Apple Pencil in our Note, just drew a little kind of stage diagram, stage layout diagram of the same kind that I'm sure everyone has had to draw a stage layout diagram for some some theater technicians at some point in, in your life. It's really easy to do that kind of drawing. It uses the built-in kind of system standard drawing tools, which are, are really pretty nice um, and, and very useful. So you can, you know, I just drew a grand piano and a music stand and a stage line super easy and it's right there in the note. So you could draw this in your note and send that as part of the, the public facing note to another person who needs to know what the stage layout is gonna look like for a performance. So yeah. I've not done that, but I intend to in, in, the coming few, in the coming months. And we haven't leaned into this point, but it, it's worth mentioning like what makes craft great is how beautiful not only the results look but like the actual design of the program itself like you're it's really designed to feel awesome on mac and ios devices and that direct input from the apple pencil is just one of the ways where they've just locked down that philosophy and sharing things out i get and i know you've mentioned this too i think the web pages that it creates actually look pretty slick um, and, and I think one, one cool feature that you may have mentioned in describing your, your kind of blog draft uh, pitches that you were doing earlier is that you can turn this off, but by default, um, people can leave comments on your note and they are kind of a per paragraph comment. It looks a lot, if you've um, left comments or seen comments that people have left on Medium blog posts, it looks a lot like the comments of a Medium blog post where it is attached to a particular paragraph or a particular block in the, the, the note. So if you've got a bulleted list, someone can leave a comment on one of your bullet points. Um, if you've got a, 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 a file that you've uploaded, someone can leave a comment that is attached to that file. And it's really useful for getting feedback on things. So for something like this, where I were you know, collaborating with some other people to put together a performance and I wanted to propose a stage diagram, even if they're not craft users, I could share this public link to them on a web page that they could just open up and look at. And if they f had feedback for me, they could just click the little feedback button and add a note that I would see later to my stage diagram. And they, they might say, you know what, uh, I actually need a, a, a third stand because I, I, you know, I need for my, you know, marimba balance or whatever. Um, and that's the sort of thing that I might forget, but that, that I would need to include here. And so that kind of thing um, where you can not only make a public note, but make a public note that solicits feedback is super useful and super cool. Um, have you I'll, talked about all the workflows that you want to talk about? I've, I've got a handful. Yeah, I've got a handful. So let me just um, explain a couple more ways that this has replaced other workflows in my life this teaching year. So like... I think it's important for a music program to have some kind of public facing thing. So we will always have an EMMS music.org. There will always be one. There will always be a place where a family can go to learn a little bit about how we structure our ensembles, what offerings we have before and after school during the school day, uh, a place to get some general public information. But there's also a lot of student and parent facing information that is really cumbersome to upload to a website. You first, you need an internet connection persistently. Um, you might be dealing with, in our case, it's Squarespace, which is probably the easiest to use of the what you see is what you get website editors. But it's still really cumbersome. You know, you got uh, you got to rely on the web, and there's it's got this kind of weird block editor, and sometimes things don't, like, you drag and drop a block 
on one part of the page it doesn't land exactly where you thought it would and there's no real way to undo your work so now you're just like dragging and dropping like these little image and text blocks until it looks right it's really frustrating and when the dominant type of information i'm sharing is like text (laughs) why not just build that in something that's great at text which can publish to the web and craft has really started to replace certain components of our website where I would want to just really quickly share some information or I would want to uh, maybe share some files or some audio recordings, um, just just really anything that would face my students. And this actually sort of extends into Canvas or learning and management software because Canvas has its own kind of issues being like a predominantly web-first experience. Uh, also having an inscrutable hierarchy, like it's impossible to figure out like where things actually live in Canvas. Um, in Craft, everything is a document. One, there's one instance of every document, and then you can create infinite links uh, from documents to documents or from lines of text to other documents. You can kind of create this whole network of your ideas, but everything only exists really in one place. Whereas Canvas, like, <laughs> I have like a separate file directory for every single course I teach, and sometimes like I have to upload the same file to each file directory of each course. It's And then like we have this element called a module which is kind of like you're creating a folder that you can put course content in and course content can include anything from an assignment description to um a page which can just be like a simple like page on the web that has like text and youtube videos embedded and instructions and things and you can put quizzes in there and all sorts of different stuff can be organized um but it's ultimately not a super friendly thing to use. One great example is if you do depend on the modules to organize your work, for whatever reason, every time you go to the modules section of your class, all of them are like collapsed for whatever reason. And then when you start scrolling, at least on my computer, they all uncollapse. And then I get shot back up to the top of the page and then I have to start scrolling all over again. And it's like, who wants to deal with that? Who wants to deal with that when so much of that information is not even specific to the platform? Like, I get it. A quiz is a type of Canvas data where, like, I can create questions and tell the quiz what are the correct answers. And then a kid can go through it and it'll automatically grade them. That's awesome. That's like a totally powerful thing that's unique to canvas but me sharing information like my band handbook like why does that need to be in canvas when i can just have a craft document and now no longer is the handbook because it used to be like a word document which i would print out and staple together and give to the kids and then there would be a web version that i would edit in a different place and then like i would have to take that and like put a link to it in canvas why not just have one craft document that is the band handbook and then give the link out to the kids and it can look so much nicer and be so much more accessible to them digitally than making it this piece of can- this canvas content that can so easily get lost uh, in the mix. So that's one example. But then you can kind of ex- look back at, well, what are all the kinds of information that I give to my students? Because like they need to know their sectional schedule. They need to know who's in which sectionals. Um, They need to have a record of communication that I've had with them. And I draft a lot of my Canvas messages home in Craft First. So, like, I can actually create a little wiki page, which I have done, called Ellicott Mills Middle School Band. And I can put the link to that right in Canvas. I have it. It says, click here. And that's pretty much the only thing in my main Canvas course page right now is a link to... Love it. A craft document. And the craft document can be a place where I share resources as well. Like, for example, this year I've been making these um, these play-along resources for students to, uh, when, when we learn a new piece of music, I give everyone a copy of everyone's part, but I have to take like measures one through eight and write the flute part for every instrument and then write the tuba part for every instrument. And I'm doing that all in Dorico, and then I'm exporting the PDFs as these organized like sheet music guides where I can say like play, um, you know, play part C, and now everyone is playing the tenor saxophone part of measures 27 through 32. Nice. But like, like organizing that on canvas is just a hot mess. Whereas it's just a drag and drop interface in craft. And because we're on Chromebooks that are touch screens, uh, you don't even want to know what opening a PDF embedded in canvas looks like on a Chromebook. It's a mess, but craft just, opens I've seen up. it. You've seen it. <laughs> it's bad. Yeah. It's like, yeah, it's like the scrolling is janky, and then you have to hit an extra button to go into full screen mode, and then it never exactly behaves the way you want. Whereas Craft, you just open the PDF that you want, and then the sheet music goes full screen, end of story. It's very, very friendly right. to use on the receiving end. So I've got tons of information in there. I 
I was uh, in my today note recently and I was thinking, you know what I need to do today? I need to share the concert recordings with the families. And then because of COVID, we had a handful of kids who were absent and their makeup assessment was part, a component of that makeup was going to be adjudicating our performance recordings with the same sheet that a judge would use at like our March. In, in March, we go get assessed by uh, judges that, you know, we call it the band adjudication. Uh, right. So I like right from within the today note typed the at symbol and then typed in draft message home to parents about concert recordings, whatever. And then that became its own note, which was linked into the today note. And then I click into that note and then I start drafting my note. And then I just dragged and dropped the concert recordings into that craft document. In addition to the PDF of the adjudicator sheet that I needed the kids who missed the concerts print. And then I, that was like the draft for the canvas message. So I copied and pasted that text into the canvas message. But then instead of like attaching tons of files to the canvas message, I just put in a link straight to that craft document where they could go and get all of the assets and stuff that they needed. So it's just become this kind of like, um, you know, some, some software is like gets worse when it does more and more stuff, but craft is like, it's a hard, it's a hard kind of like concept to wrap your head around. But once you do it, you realize that it's can be this really beautiful and intuitive thing, but that covers lots of ground and can fill lots of different use cases. Yeah, I'm listening to you talk about those things. I just got a bunch of ideas about how I can use craft more in in different ways with with my students next semester. I'm going to be teaching a graduate seminar in the spring, and so this will be an awesome place for me to include links to to the readings that we're going to do for the class. Um, for the ensemble that I direct is a mixed chamber ensemble, new music ensemble. Um, this would be a great way for us to kind of collaborate on the the repertoire it's a it's a it's five players right now there are four of them are graduate students and so they take a lot of ownership over the repertoire that we play um and so this would be a great way for us to work together on that and for me to post you know rehearsal schedules and things like that um so yeah i think i think there's and and also i've been you mentioned you have a band handbook i we currently don't have a composition studio handbook and i've been meaning to create one for a long long time and i think this would be a really cool place to do it and i'm simply going to have to give up on my my um my love both of WordPress for for creating tiny little mini sites like this and my love of writing everything in pure plain text markdown for things like this. And I don't want you to sell me on Obsidian right now. Um, but uh, this is uh, the 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 sort of thing that I would I would I think I would enjoy building something like this in craft because I think, and I think that's something you, you got at earlier when you talked about how nice and friendly and beautiful the user interface is. I think it's like genuinely as much as any of this is fun to use. Yeah, it really is. And that's, that's the thing that you got to understand too. And, and it's not the kind of thing I think for this and obsidian, which we will talk about, but for this category of app, it wasn't until I kind of dove in that it made any sense to me at all. And then it made 100% sense to me. Like I thought to myself, why wouldn't I want all of my data to be in a personal totally. knowledge man management app? And it wasn't until though that I, like I really had to commit. It was like, it's not appealing to you if you just start yes. like typing one or two notes, you're going to be like, okay, it's kind of like a text editor, but it's in my way a little bit with these blocks. What, what is this adding to my life? It's not until you have lots of information in, in it that you see how easy it is to bounce from one idea to another on a whim. I totally agree, and I think um, you know that that sort of thing is is the same thing that convinced me. I will say, if you are leery of putting much of data into a thing and wondering, you know, what will happen if slash when something like this um, goes away, what are you going to do with your notes? It is very easy to to get notes into and out of Craft. So if you're using something else um, that that you can export your notes from, if you can export them as HTML documents, if you can, the, I think the the most powerful one is a text bundle, which is how I got my bare notes into Craft. Um, you can export and import a lot of stuff, and it's it's actually um, you know really. Pretty pretty easy to use, and 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 Craft makes it really pretty easy to get in and out. Yeah, um, that's actually maybe we're getting to a good point for me to just briefly mention Obsidian, because um, I can speak firsthand. Obsidian is one of the competitors I've been playing with, and every time 
I really want to kind of see like, okay, what's it would be like, what would it be like to put my entire workflow in craft? It's so incredibly easy to get Obsidian data into craft because Obsidian, while it shares a lot of features in common with craft, it is uh, instead of sort of like it having its own proprietary document style that you work with, it actually is just looking at a folder of text files on your computer, which is, I believe, a strength. But because of that, it's so easy to just like import them all into Craft. And Craft interprets, if you write in Markdown, which is, uh, for those who don't know, it's a syntax where like if you put like, um, like if you do a bullet point list or a numbered list or you bold stuff, um, it sort of is like a plain text way, almost like HTML, but easier to remember. And it makes the uh, text easier to read if someone else is looking at it. It's not like obscured by all of the code. Um, it, you know, Craft is able to both read and save as Markdown. So if I take a URL and put it into a Craft document, it'll make a nice pretty thumbnail of it. But if I export that out of Craft, it'll export it in a plain text document that is simply like the syntax for a linkable URL in Markdown, which is like uh, a bracket with, I don't need to get into it actually, delete me saying that. If you want to know more about Markdown, I'll link, I have kind of a blog post about how I use it in my learning management software that I'll put in the in the notes to this episode. But anyway, Obsidian. Um, Obsidian is, I, I think people who are really hardcore about using Obsidian would not really say that it's anything like Craft, but the things that I like to do with this category of software, it actually has a lot of um, crossover between the two because Obsidian is similarly really good at doing backlinking between notes it, um, it, it, like I said, it's it's looking at a bucket or a folder, a literal folder of text files on your computers, um, on your computer. So like I can just, you know, what's what's cool about that is that I can open those in other applications. So if I want to take a blog post, I'm drafting in Obsidian and open it in an application like I really, I really like a uh, IA Writer, which is a text editing application for drafting blog posts in Markdown. I can just open it in any any program I want. Um, I can really easily drag and drop data around. Uh, this is just like a real small thing, but it's like a nice quality of life thing. The other day, uh, I was trying to remember how to spell a student's name, and I couldn't remember how to spell their name. But because that student had uh, a, a file in Obsidian, and that file was just like a dot, you know, txt file living on my hard drive, I just opened up the Spotlight command space and started typing that student's name, and then it like was the first search result was that student's name. It's like, oh yeah, that's how you spell that student's name. Um, so it's it's just like nice to be able to get around. Uh, Obsidian, because it's working dominantly in text, whereas Craft is working with rich media, um, Obsidian is a, a lot easier to type into. I feel like I can just start typing text into it a thousand times easier than I can Craft. Sometimes Craft's block style interface gets a little bit in my way. I want to just click once into an area of a Craft document and start typing, but I feel like I have to sometimes click twice, or sometimes I click and I accidentally drag a block somewhere else or select a block. Um, Obsidian is a lot more writer friendly. So if your notes are dominantly like text, then you might find it easier. Now, I don't personally believe that that many people listening to a music education podcast want to play with Obsidian because it is the power user friendly, you know, uh, entry into this sort of space. So it's it's not as friendly. Um, it doesn't look as pretty uh, because it's all in text. You have to understand Markdown in order to make things look nice because it's rather than like links and bold text and headings automatically just appearing as they are when you enter them um in obsidian you have to go into a preview mode so you'll you'll be looking at like you know the the markdown syntax for bolding something is to just you could like put an asterisk around both sides of the text you want to be bold um that looks exactly like you typed it in non-preview mode but or i guess editor mode they call it but in preview mode everything will look really good so in craft what you see is what you get in obsidian they're making it uh, a new version that's coming out soon that's what you see is what you get but uh it's pretty much just all plain text until you trigger it into preview mode um, and I will say one of the other strengths of Obsidian that, that you may not have um, dwelt on as much is that it has for a very long time had a plugin architecture. And so it has this uh, kind of palette of infinite possibilities of what you can do with your notes in Obsidian because 
anybody can and many, many people have created a, a plugins to do the things that you might want to do. Um, so that, that makes um, Obsidian in, in some important ways uh, more powerful than craft at the moment. And it's, I think, kind of what Robbie's getting at when he says that Obsidian is more of the, the power user tool. It's a tool for people who want to spend a lot of time making their tool before they use it or while they're using it. Yeah, and for that reason, it's it's a lot more flexible and customizable, but you have to be willing to spend the time to customize it. Right. Here's a, here's it's a great worth example. noting, though. Go ahead. Oh, I was Give just going to say, like, as an example, like, it doesn't look pretty out of the box, but you can install a theme that someone has created. I use one called Minimal, and it makes it look a thousand percent better. Still not as good as Craft, but uh, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot better. Um, so not only can you, like, customize what the app can do by installing third-party developers' plugins, but you can install the style of its interface. Um, so the, the thing that I was going to say is that uh, one thing that is worth noting at this juncture is that Craft does not currently have uh, a, a, an extensive set of plugins that are available. But as of this recording, we're only a couple of weeks into the Craft developer platform for Craft extensions being available in beta. And it's gone through several iterations already just in the few weeks that it has been available. Um, and I would expect to see a lot more um, development in this space as the developer tools become more popular and people have time to build some some useful things with them. So there are already a handful of useful little uh, craft extensions that are available. Um, you do have to kind of go in manually and say, yes, I agree that I'm, I'm, I'm a nerd and I'm bringing all the pain upon myself by using this tool in beta. Um, and, you know, that comes with all the caveats of using any beta. I'm sure Robbie's talked about this on the program a lot before. Um, but I think we can expect to see many of the same kinds of tools in craft in the extensions that you might see in the Obsidian plugins um, over the next year or so. Yeah, I think if I had to like look into the future and see myself using one of these two apps instead of both, probably craft is where I would want to be. Um, it's hard to imagine the level of plugins that are in obsidian existing on craft, but I, I'm really eager to see what people make. I'm looking at one right now. Um, I, I still do use obsidian to draft blog posts for the most part um, and to track local data on students. So uh, I do have like, Oh, and obsidian also has that today note feature, which is just like so good. And it functions very, very similarly in both apps. Um, but one example of a cool plugin is like, if you're using the to do app to doist, you can install a third-party plugin into Obsidian, which will, like, inside of a text note, will show you, like, a bit of your Todoist app. So, like, for example, if you have a note where you're um, taking notes on a specific project, like, for me, I have, like, a note for this very podcast. And let's just say that I was using Todoist to manage my tasks for this project. I'm not, but I know enough about Todoist to have experimented with this plugin. Um, you can actually have... Like I could have the Music Ed Tech Talk project from Todoist show up in line with the rest of my Obsidian note. And I can even like rearrange and like check off the tasks right from within it. So it's like you can put an app in an app. Yo dog. Um, another one is I really like Kanban boards for certain kinds of data. I've used Trello. That's an app that uh, I totally recommend people check out. It's free. Um, but for for this show, I use a board to kind of like manage which episodes are in which stages. So like has something been edited? Has it been published? Has it been shared on social media? Who are people I just simply want to contact? And uh, what I like about it, uh, there's a there's a really cool plugin called Kanban. Is it Kanban? Kanban board? Kanban? I, well, you can take a plugin and install it that will look like, let's say that you have like a heading and then a bullet point list inside of an obsidian note and then another heading and then another bullet point list and then another heading and then a bullet point list. It'll actually format that style of a markdown note as a board with draggable cards, just like a Trello board. And it is nuts to see. I'm sending you a text real quick of a, this is like, um, it's like uh, some notes. This is the current workspace I have. And you can also in Obsidian, a lot of people like that you can sort of like take a couple of notes that are open side by side and like 
save them as a workspace so that you can get back to it. So what I'm sending you is a text of my board on the right side in preview mode so you can see all the little draggable cards. And then on the left, mm -hmm. nice. um, you can see a note, which is where I'm taking uh, basically what will become the basis of the blog post for posting a future or actually at this point point of this recording a past episode of the show but what's cool is like in the prep editing category all of the different episodes that i'm currently preparing um you can like give a due date to a card and then even associate a separate obsidian note with it and those will backlink to nice. each other so it's kind of a nice environment for this it's one of the reasons i haven't totally left the app um I really, I really dig it. But if I had to recommend one of these things to anyone, it would absolutely be craft hands down. And I can even see a future where um, Obsidian's lack of sharing a public link to something like you can publish Obsidian stuff, but you sort of have to take a folder of documents and share the entire thing. You can't just like take a single freestanding note and give a link to it. Um, I don't know. Maybe they'll add that down in the future, but uh, craft is, is definitely uh, looking promising with their craft X. Uh, I guess we should talk about pricing. Yeah, let's do it. So uh, we're both, I think, are you using the free year of the educator version? I bought it before the free educator thing existed. So okay, I good. used the regular 50% discount, which is, I think, still very reasonable. Yeah, totally. Um, I will absolutely be buying this when it comes around to the end of my so free you, year. So you can use Craft for free um, and it's feature limited to the number of blocks which is basically paragraphs or bullet points or images or whatever each item is its own block you get a thousand blocks for free and I imagine if you're going to use this for anything especially if you're making lists that each one of those list elements is a block so you might use a thousand pretty quickly um, you can export uh, to PDF and things like that, but you, you do get device sync, which a lot of other things don't give you for free. Um, but you don't get a lot of the cool features that Robbie and I have been talking about. So if you're, um, an educator, you can get 50% off, but normally it's 45 bucks a year. And then that gives you all of the, the things we've been talking about, like web publishing is the big thing for me. Um, that you wouldn't get with the, the free version. But, um, again, if you apply as an educator for a 50% discount, you know, 45 bucks a year becomes 2250 a year, which I think is totally reasonable for what I'm getting. Um, and I'm, I'm very happy with it. If you were lucky enough, like Robbie to catch this deal when it was announced basically for the whole month of September this year, 2021, um, they were offering a free year of craft to educators um, and students. So that's a really cool thing. I don't know if they'll do something like that again in the future. Um, maybe it will only be for your for, for new customers or something like that. Um, I can imagine this being a, a thing that would appeal to a lot of students as well for many of the same reasons that appeals to us as educators. Um, but if you are uh, thinking about it, it's definitely worth checking out the free version. And I would I would seriously consider the, the paid version. It's super reasonable price that's again for the whole year 2250 for educators that's a great deal do you want to uh, mention how much obsidian costs by comparison i should or are you going to save that for an obsidian show no i will yeah i actually so I should... have no idea yeah obsidian is free entirely free to use um there are a couple of paid add-ons but i do not feel like they are essential to the way that i would want to use the app so one of the add-ons is to publish things. And I, as I mentioned before, the publishing does not quite give you the same level of flexibility that Craft does. And it's definitely not as easy or direct to use. Um, you have to install a plugin to use it. And while you do pay monthly as you would do for Craft to get their premium thing, um, you can only, of course, upload a folder of things and they're all sort of like accessible. You get a little like URL that they give you that you can share. It's kind of designed for people who want to treat a folder of obsidian documents almost at, like a wiki and then kind of share the whole entire thing but that just really leaves out a lot of possible use cases for sharing your work on the web so um the other one is called sync where if you want if you want obsidian to host all of your files you can pay them and then it's encrypted end to end uh, rather than like storing the text files on just any old folder like i use an, a folder of text files that's in my iCloud drive. 
And because that is syncing across all my Apple devices, Obsidian is just on all of my devices pointing to that folder. Um, so you can get that full range of features for free. There's also like a um, like an early access, I forget what they call it. I think Catalyst is what they call it. It's like basically just like you're a bonus supporter and you get to try some test builds of things a little earlier than everyone, but mostly you're just donating to the app's development. And there's um, no, is there any, is there any kind of uh, discount available to educators? Not for, for the Obsidian? sync or for the publish or any of those add-ons. Okay. Those are um, the only ones I would want. Yeah, I'm I'm trying the the sync. I'm sorry, I'm currently trying the publish because they had a really uh, good deal for a whole year of it earlier this year, and I'm just not finding myself to use it a ton. Uh, it's been a worthwhile experiment, but I think that in the future I'm just going to keep craft for all my public stuff. And I've seen the published pages uh, from Obsidian. I think they look okay, but I think the craft pages look a little nicer. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, maybe I'll just mention real quick if this kind of category of software interests you, just so that you know there are other options. I know that Rome Research is very popular amongst some Mac users, and uh, Notion, which is a very, very much like a web-first kind of option. Um, it, it first Not to be existed. confused with PreSonus Notion correct which was mentioned earlier on the episode no notion is like another one of these personal knowledge management apps um it is it does all, actually in some respects it does more things than craft or obsidian does it's got a whole lot of like database management and like task management and like team project management stuff involved in it um i have not found it to be that great for me because it doesn't have awesome first party apps for the mac for the ipad or for the iphone so i, I have not been drawn to it but um I know a couple people who are really committed to it, and I believe that it has a pretty generous free tier. Hey, it's me, Robbie. I'm editing this show, and I'm just dropping in to let you know that what I mentioned earlier in the episode about having some listener feedback, that's going to happen now. So um, we were talking about the topic of craft on the Music Ed Tech Talk Discord, which is a benefit that Patreon supporters receive. And um, one of the members of the Discord and listener of the show, Ayler, is doing some really cool stuff with Craft. So I thought to ask him uh, if he would be willing to share a little bit about that workflow. And he did. He recorded an audio sample. So here that is. Just another idea so that you don't think that David and I are just two crazy people. Um, but that this application actually has um, broad use and can fulfill lots of different goals, whatever you want to do with it. So here it is. There are two primary ways that I'm uh, making use of craft right now for my students, for my band program, for my lessons. The first way is through a series of student lesson logs, um, a, a lot like other people are doing. The Lesson log itself is for an individual student. I have uh, a mix of individual and small group lessons. So every student has their own page in Craft, and they have a copy of that link. Now, their page has links to their group lesson if they're in it, and I am able to link to all sorts of resources that I make on Craft from their log. Um, I do always a uh, triple uh, heading three full with the date on it um, to help keep track of when we're taking care of what. I have a series of semester-long assessments, and I am able to put those right at the top of their lesson log and just kind of check through, have a checklist of them as we're going. In addition to that checklist, I can then put under each individual lesson what their score on a given assessment was and the goal on them all is that they get to 100% on all of those and we kind of just reassess until they are. And we can know what we worked on, whether that was band music or an assignment out of their lesson book. For the students who are in group lessons, I don't have uh, links back to the individual page because I want to keep that for just that individual student. So they are asked to keep track on their Chromebooks with a bookmark for of their uh, individual lesson page. On the group side of things, I can just make a small note of, of what we got to, who was there, uh, broadly what we did, but not scores. In addition to the lesson pages that I'm running, I've got a big set of resources for students and families, kind of comparable to a wiki, if you will. And that's, that's how I refer to it, uh, to the students, as the craft wiki. I've got on my 
main page of that links to the uh, music for all the assessments, what, they, what every grades assessment is as I teach 5 through 12, um, our performance dates, of course, and all sorts of helpful resources for students to better understand what we're doing, whether that's a uh, short page explaining what transposition is for students on transposing instruments or recordings of the pieces that we are currently working on, links to the tuner or metronome apps I recommend, uh, additional copies of their scale sheets, fingering charts, uh, links to sites where they can find music of their own. Um, and I am continuing to experiment with what is appropriate to put in there, what is going to be beneficial for the kids for me to put in there. And it is always a work in progress. I mean, it is kind of handwritten theory explainers for certain things. And whenever I find some time and the will to sit down and write out some more theory explainers that I think are friendly enough for my entire grade range, I sit down and do so. It's really nice having this central hub for this information because I can continue to reuse it year after year instead of having a handout that I feel like I have to revise every time I give it. Um, it's additionally nice for recordings to post on here because I can link right to them from students' lesson pages. Compared to what I had to do with Google Classroom for some of those links, or even uh, individual students with Google Drive, I, our Chromebooks sometimes misbehave with audio files specifically through Google Drive, which is something that I've struggled to troubleshoot time and time again. And using Craft as the main source for this and just embedding it into their lesson logs, A, hopefully makes it easier for the kids to get to in the first place, and B, totally gets around that problem. It's fun to talk about it after using it like so rigorously since August. Yeah. I, I mean, I, like I said, I, I think it's something that becomes more useful. And I guess you said this, it becomes more useful and more fun once you really commit to doing a lot more work in it. And it, I think it can um, maybe not replace and maybe it can replace some apps that a lot of people are currently using but it can certainly um, be in a really useful and practical add-on and I, i've been really enjoying it awesome well that moves us to app album and tech tip of the week um all right well i am uh proudly recording this episode on a brand new m1 14 inch MacBook Pro. And I've got a lot to say about this machine that I feel like <laughs> that I feel like deserves more than a minute. But what I'll say for now is that one of the many things that you can do if you're on an M1 Mac is you can run iOS apps natively on the device. And now not all makers of iOS apps have enabled their software to run on the Mac, but there are a couple of pretty good apps for the iPad that'll run on the Mac. Um, things, you know, everything from like HBO to like, I think Amazon Prime will run on the Mac. Uh, Overcast, my favorite podcast player, will run. Um, Apollo, which is a, a Reddit client I use, is good. Um, there's a whole discussion actually about this and other many other subjects adjacent to the M1 Macs in the pre-show, which if you are a Patreon subscriber to Music Ed Tech Talk, uh, and you are a backstage subscriber, you can listen to all of that fun discussion between the two of us. But I thought that I would just sort of tease that discussion by mentioning the Documents app by Riedel, which we kind of discussed in that pre-show at great length. But it is uh, an iPad app for managing your documents, which is not something that typically you would need on a Mac because you have the Finder. But what I really like about it is that They've released it for the M1 Mac, and uh, because on the iPad, it was originally designed as a way to sort of like aggregate your local files, your Google Drive files, and your Dropbox files, and all your cloud stuff. Well, it kind of acts on the Mac as a Google Drive client. So while I find the Google Drive app to be super frustrating and cumbersome on the Mac, uh, the Documents app by Riedel will now run on my Mac, and I can have my Google Drive credentials logged in and use it as kind of a way to interact with the files that I store there without having it constantly running in the background and like wasting CPU on my computer while also adding some really friendly features. Like it is insanely easy to grab a URL link to a file or a folder in my Google Drive using the Documents app. Don't know why it's not that simple on um, 
you know, using the actual like Google Drive app on the Mac, but there it is. Documents by Riedel, an iPad app, which will run directly on an M1 Mac. So my app of the week is very similar to Documents in that it predates the Files app and does a lot of the things that the Files app on the iPad does. But it's uh, it's one of the really early apps that did this. It's called GoodReader, um, and it syncs with a lot of different kinds of cloud services and you can even have it work with very nerdy things like network attached storage and you know ftp storage and all kinds of things like that um and it's a really useful way of having a lot of control over what things sync so i can have a, a tiny little subfolder in my Dropbox that syncs down to my iPad. Um, and I use this a lot for the audio examples that I present in my classroom teaching. Um, I will clip out, you know, 20 seconds, 90 seconds, whatever of a thing. I usually do that in Fission, put that in a folder of audio examples for Theory 1 or whatever. And then on my iPad, I can manually have Goodreader sync just that folder, and I can set that sync to only go one way so that I can't accidentally delete a file on my iPad that will then get deleted everywhere. Um, and then I can play the audio from right there in Goodreader. It works in SlideOver. It works in Split View, which are really useful when I'm, when I'm teaching class. Um, and the, the feature of Goodreader that keeps it the thing that I use for this all the time. It is, is the only one of the applications that is like this that I have found that will play audio in the background and automatically stop after playing an audio file. So it does not automatically move on to the next audio file in the folder or the next song in the playlist or whatever. It will stop when the thing is over. Um, so that's a really useful thing for me. And that's why I'm using uh, Goodreader, which is uh, an old and it looks a little bit old uh, application, but it works great. And I am, am really grateful for it every time I use it. Nice. Well, music of the week. So um, every year, until this year. I've done a little fun blog post where I go to NPR's best 50 albums of the year and I turn them all onto an Apple music playlist. And it's a fun little ritual for me this time of year. And I reflect on what music that I thought was good that they apparently also thought was good. But then I learn about a lot of new music and I listen to some of it over the, you know, the holiday break while I'm going through the hustle of whatever kinds of errands I might be running and then into the next you know into the new year I'll listen to and digest all this new music and um, th that tradition stops now because NPR has made their own Apple Music playlist and I just feel like it would be entirely useless for me to do what they've already done so I'm going to link in the notes the best uh, 50 best albums of 2021 there's a Spotify and an Apple Music version of this uh, I will just mention there's a couple of albums on here that have been previous album of the week picks on the show. The Hiatus Coyote record that came out this year is quite good. Um, there was another one that caught my eye that I don't think has been mentioned on the show. Um, Oh, the Silk Sonic record is on there. Did you listen to that one? That's, I was going to, that was going to be my album of the week. Perfect segue. Go for it. <laughs> So my my album of the week is Silk Sonic's new record uh, called An Evening with Silk Sonic. So Silk Sonic is a is a duo featuring um, no, Anderson Bruno Pac. Mars and, and Anderson Mars, Pack. Yeah. And um, so the the two of them have been a, a, they've released singles before. This is their first album. It's still relatively short as albums go, um, but. I really dig it. It's got. It also features Bootsy Collins. Um, so if you are listening to it as I was and thinking that sounds a lot like Bootsy Collins, sure enough, that's who it is. Um, so uh, it's it's I think a, an interesting fusion of a lot of disco influences and hip hop influences and R and B influences in a way that I find to be very pleasing. Uh, so I've been I've been listening to it a lot since it came out a few weeks ago so good <laughs> it's, it's, it's really it's good really really good it's very it's very very uh tasteful record all right well uh tech tip of the week so i'm gonna this is i'm gonna hijack this and actually kind of just do another app of the week because i don't think better touch tool has been ever a pick of mine 
That Is was it your pick? on my no, it was not my pick, but I did have a a better touch tool related tip that I was going to use we as both as, do as a tip someday. Let's um, let's. I, okay. I will. I think this app deserves more airtime than I'm going to give it now. But this is an app that allows you to take gestures of the keyboard, mouse, trackpad, um, touch bar MIDI if you have devices. one on your Mac. For, yeah, like MIDI devices, like but pretty much any like tr- like device that is like an input method for a computer. It allows you to uh, automate stuff on your computer by triggering these. So like one of my favorites is I have automated my trackpad to if I take three fingers and swipe down it'll close the current tab I have open in Safari. If I do a three finger swipe up, it'll open a new tab. And I just sometimes like to navigate the web without taking my fingers off the trackpad. You might be saying, hey, guess what? The keyboard is like a couple of inches away from where your hand is, but guess what? I am very delighted by my three finger swipe up and down for creating a new tab. It's very nice. Um, so I, one of the new features of Better Touch Tool is it's got shortcuts integration and shortcuts is now on the Mac and you can create fun little automations on your Mac that string together numerous step procedures that you would do. You can just make them into one step procedures where you you run a shortcut and it'll, you know, open your favorite apps, close some apps you don't need. It'll send a text message to a loved one. It'll um, open a website. You can have all that happen in uh, one single shortcut. But what better touch tool does is it can trigger shortcuts and also the actions that you can automate in Better Touch Tool are now available as actions in the Shortcuts app. So I have a shortcut that I run every day when I start my band rehearsal. I mentioned it in a very recent episode. And this shortcut makes all of my devices open the software that I need to run my rehearsal across my iPhone, my iPad, and my Mac. And I have created a triple, sorry, a three-finger double tap on the trackpad of my Mac will initiate this fun little dance. So when I plug in all my junk at the front of the band rehearsal and then I tap twice with three fingers on my trackpad, then all of a sudden my Mac will open up my presentation with the agenda on it. Uh, My phone will start playing some concert band music as my students are coming in. It'll open the Tonal Energy Tuner four score and, um, and then my like seating chart for the class will open on my iPad and then in a little slide over window, the agenda for the day, which I create in craft, will open on the side so that I can like see what I need to say and like rehearse at the beginning of class. So it's kind of fun to automate that with a gesture. So it's interesting you a three finger double tap. Bleh. It's interesting that you mentioned the three finger double tap because that's a gesture I use as well. For me, three finger double tap will use whatever keyboard shortcut is appropriate for the current application to leave a comment. So there's a a keyboard shortcut to make a comment in preview to put a little kind of yellow sticky note that you can leave a comment in a PDF for, or if I'm looking at a Sibelius file uh, and I wanna leave a comment somewhere in the Sibelius file or whatever application I'm looking at, a three finger tap, and I've done this manually in, um, in Better Touch Tool because you can say, in this application, use this gesture. So it, the gestures can be universal, like Robbie's saying, to launch a bunch of applications, but they can also be per application so that the three-finger tap in preview sends one set of keyboard information that pulls up the comment there and sends a different one if Sibelius is has focus and it leaves a comment there. So that's a really useful thing that I do with um, Better Touch Tool. The one that I have been using a little bit recently um, and I think this is true of the, the trackpad gestures as well, is one of the nice things about them is that they can't conflict with the built-in keyboard shortcuts. And I think that's the thing that all of us who spend a lot of time customizing our tools in a certain way have run into before is that you want to use a keyboard shortcut as like a universal keyboard shortcut, um, but it conflicts with a keyboard shortcut that you might sometimes need to use in Dorico or Sibelius or whatever that has a really rich collection of keyboard shortcuts built into it already. And you can run into all kinds of problems with this. By the way, this is, uh, I'm, I'm stealing my own tip from this most recent episode of Scoring Notes that came out uh, the day that we're recording this. Um, uh, but that's a problem that I run into a lot. And so I uh, use 
uh, better touch tool for that. And one that I've been using a little bit recently is that I have been um, working on developing a Stream Deck plugin, which means that I have to often quit and relaunch the Stream Deck application a lot. Um, and also sometimes my cat wants to come and sit on my desk while I'm working on stuff. And she, for whatever reason, loves to just flop down on my Stream Deck, <laughs> which can create all kinds of nasty problems. Um, and so when I see her hop up on my desk, I can very quickly double tap my left control key on my Apple Magic keyboard um, and it instantly quits the Stream Deck application so that the buttons won't respond to anything um, when she does flop on it. Um, so anyway, those are really useful as well. I've got another one set up to relaunch the Stream Deck application by tapping the Option key twice or um, Shift option, shift option will do something. Um, I've I've got a bunch of these that are that are key sequences that don't actually do anything in any application because they're only like patterns with the modifier keys, um, but they can be used as better touch tool triggers, which is pretty cool. I gotta start doing some key sequences. That sounds like a yeah, you can use them to do things that you might do with text expander where you're like literally typing things um, for key sequences. But I really like them with the modifier keys because by themselves, the modifier keys don't do anything in most applications. Totally. Yeah. Wow. All right. Well, I've got some some new ideas for better touch tool. I thought I was already overwhelmed with all the new shortcut stuff, but I, I got to experiment with some sequences. That's pretty cool. Yeah, it's pretty fun. Well, I think that concludes this one. You're going to be back pretty soon because uh, the next episode is uh, going to be kind of like a New Year's special. And it's featuring some recent frequent guests. Um, you're going to be there. Will Kuhn will be there. Craig McClellan, my co-host on the Class Nerd podcast, will be there. And then John Tippins, the first guest ever on the Music Ed Tech Talk will be there. And we're going to just each prepare like three or four questions that are topical. Some are, some are not. And then we're going to just like do that, like a rapid fire, like lightning round of like everyone's questions they've generated. Every podcaster ever thinks they're about to do a lightning round. And then 30 minutes later, they finish the lightning round. No, we're going to get through like one round of questions, I think. Yeah, I think that's likely. That seems right. Sounds about right. I don't think there's... Okay. Is there anything else you want to say? Oh, where should people... I can never assume... I can never assume that just because you've been on the show before that everyone knows who you are. Where can people find you in your work on the on the internet? Um, the easiest place to find my stuff is to start from my website. That's davidmacdonaldmusic.com. Uh, and I'm also on Twitter. I have a blog that's at a separate URL, um, but you can find links to all of that at davidmcdonaldmusic.com, including my music. Buy my music. All right, I'm Robbie Burns. Thanks for listening to Music Ed Tech Talk. You can find the show's page, show notes for this episode, and my blog at musicedtechtalk.com. You can subscribe to blog posts through an RSS app of your choice, and you can subscribe to the podcast in a podcast app of your choice. You can now get blog posts delivered right into your email inbox once a week. Please rate and review the show and the podcast app you use. It absolutely helps. It'll only take a second and a few taps. Word of mouth is helpful too, so please spread the word about the show. You can learn more about my teaching and music career at RobbieBurns.com. I'm on Twitter, Facebook, Twitch, and YouTube at Robbie Burns. Please consider supporting me on Patreon at Patreon.com slash Music Ed Tech Talk. All support tiers get perks. But even the base tier gives you a monthly video update with app and music recommendations and tech tips and access to the Music Ed Tech Talk Discord community where you can chat with other supporters and guests of the show about music, apps, pedagogy, lesson ideas, tech support, and more. It's a fun place to be. All right, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>